Welcome, everyone. Um, good afternoon to you. Um, we're uh, about to begin a panel entitled From the Insurrection Act to Police Reform, Legal Issues in the Wake of George Floyd's Death. Um, needless to say, um, his death and the nation's reaction to it have raised quite a few uh, interesting legal issues, including police reform, civil rights, qualified immunity, uh, censorship, the scope of the president's power to use troops to quell uh, civil unrest, um, and uh, you know what sort of charges are appropriate against uh, policemen like those in, in Minneapolis. Uh, our three panelists are uh, three renowned legal experts, David Rivkin, Andy McCarthy, and John Yu, and they'll analyze the legal issues involved, how they're likely to play out in the coming months, as well as any uh, broader implications for, uh, for the law and uh, for our society generally. I'm Kurt Levy. I'm president of the Committee for Justice. I'll be uh, moderating, and after the panelists speak, I'll, I'll ask them some questions, and then we'll take audience questions. Uh, the best way to ask questions is through the Zoom uh, Q&A function. Um, so uh, please uh, type your questions there. And uh, let me uh, introduce the, the panelists in the order that they'll speak. Uh, John Yu is the Emanuel Heller Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley. He's a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. He was formerly a top official in the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, a law clerk for Justice Clarence Thomas. He's published more than 100 articles in academic journals on national security, constitutional law, international law, the Supreme Court. Uh, he regularly uh, contributes op-eds to the nation's top newspapers. He's written uh, 10 books. His 10th is uh, Defender-in-Chief, um, Trump's Fight for Presidential Power, which is coming out, I believe, next month. He's a graduate of Yale Law School and Harvard College. Um, next will be uh, Andy McCarthy. Uh, he is a senior fellow at the National Review Institute, uh, National Review contributing editor, a uh, prolific writer of columns analyzing the latest legal issues. Uh, like I was just telling him, it seems like he writes a new uh, great one every day. Um, he's also written a bunch of books, most recently, Ball of Collusion, The Plot to Rig an Election and Destroy a Presidency. Um, the presidency of, of Donald Trump, that is. Uh, he's a former uh, top federal prosecutor. Um, he served as a chief U.S. attorney for Southern District of New York, specifically, and uh, led the prosecution against the blind sheikh and uh, his terrorist colleagues for the uh, 93 World Trade uh, Center bombing, among other things. And uh, then last but not least, we'll hear from David Rifkin. He's a partner at the law firm Baker Hostetler. He's a co-leader of the firm's national appellate practice, a uh, member of the firm's litigation, international, and environmental team. He's been involved in numerous high-profile cases. He's developed uh, and implemented legislative, regulatory, and uh, litigation initiatives for two presidential administrations. He's published hundreds of articles, op-eds, book reviews, book chapters on a wide variety of issues ranging from international and military issues, to constitutional law, to environmental and energy issues. Uh, his op-eds are often in newspapers like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post. He's a frequent commentator and guest on national TV and on radio shows. And uh, with that, let me ask John to uh, start it off. Well, thanks, Kurt. It's uh, great to be with everybody. And I'd like to uh, thank the committee for inviting us to speak. And I'd like to really uh, say how great it is to be on uh, Zoom. I guess I was going to say on air, but I guess on Zoom <laughs> with my friends, uh, David and Andy. I, I have to say, uh, I hate David and Andy because they're <laughs> taking business away from law professors everywhere by commenting faster and better than all of us out here in the academy. How dare they? Who do these people think they are? I like to say whenever I see a article or a tweet or a blog post by both of them i really look at that first right away in the morning and it's really great to be here with you i think um if there's anyone who's unraveled all of the intricacies of what's been happening with the presidency these last three years it's been the two of them it's really great so it's really great to share um, this uh, virtual stage with them so i'm going to talk <clears throat> very quickly about the insurrection act um 
and how it pertains to the uh, violence we've seen in the wake of the Floyd killing and protests. And uh, let me say, I, I'm sure I speak for all of us, I was uh, horrified to see the video of uh, the killing of Floyd, and I think it's appropriate that he be prosecuted, and I support the right of people to peacefully uh, protest uh, and to demonstrate under the First Amendment. However, I think that the violence and looting and rioting that we've seen in some cities afterwards, uh, going so far as to even trying to declare autonomous zones in places like Seattle and Washington, D.C. that are free from federal control goes too far. And the Insurrection Act is, I think, the federal law that's uh, most relevant. Uh, it does, I think, call for federal troops to be deployed in certain, uh, certain types of domestic and civil unrest. And so you may remember President Trump said that he had the authority to call out troops. You saw his walk across Lafayette uh, Park uh, to St. John's Church, which was cleared by some mixture of law enforcement and military personnel. And he was widely criticized for this. And there were people who uh, even said he might be starting a military coup by calling on the uh, troops. Uh, but I think that is just uh, reflects ignorance <clears throat> of the Constitution and federal law. The Constitution and federal law clearly allow the federal government and delegate it to the president the authority to call out troops in certain situations of unrest. Article 1, Section 8 specifically says Congress can provide for the calling out of the militia to enforce federal law and to put down insurrections. And then there's the uh, famous Republican Guarantee Clause, which the Supreme Court has always refused to interpret, and the uh, Domestic Violence Clause, which is right next to it, which allows the federal government at the request of a state legislature or governor to send assistance to restore order in aspects of unrest. Congress has implemented its authority in the Insurrection Act, which was passed back in 1807, to implement, actually, the Embargo Act under President Jefferson, which was widely resisted throughout the country at that time. And it's been used ever since then to call out the troops, to enforce the law. <clears throat> Cases, for example, where there's been so much insurrection, so much disorder, the federal law can't be enforced where state and, federal, uh, sorry, state and local authorities are overwhelmed. Keeping in mind, as always, that under our federal system, uh, public health and safety is primarily the responsibility of state governments. You think about the resources available to those governments. The city of New York, their police department, has more officers than the entire workforce of the FBI. If it's if it's a public health and safety matter, it's primarily going to be the constitutional responsibility and up to the resources of those state and local governments. The federal government, as it does in so many other areas in our federal system, is playing a backup. It's responding to threats that cross state borders or where state and local governments are just overwhelmed. And that's what the Insurrection Act does. There's also been these arguments that the use of troops is uh, unprecedented. But again, I think that ignores history. You look at the first president, President Washington, called out the militia to put down the Whiskey Rebellion in Pennsylvania. In fact, President Washington personally led the troops. There are these stories about how there was a long column of mounted troops, and President Washington decided to be the first person in charge of the line so that he could show that the federal government intended to execute the laws. Uh, there are some arguments that Troops can't be sent by the president unless state officials invite him. That's not in the Insurrection Act. And you can look to examples such as the desegregation era. President Eisenhower sent troops to Central High School when the governor of that state, in fact, had tried to use the state uh, elements of the National Guard to oppose desegregation. He sent the hundred, President Eisenhower sent the 101st Airborne over the wishes of the governor. People might say this is something that hasn't happened recently, but of course it has happened recently. Happen, uh, the presidents have called out troops uh, to help put down riots in Los Angeles after the Rodney King verdict, and troops have regularly been called out to help in natural disaster relief, like Hurricane Katrina, for example. So I think if you look at the constitutional structure the text of federal statutes, historical practice, 
they all support the legal constitutional authority to be able to use troops in situations of disorder. The fine question, and I, I hope we get to this in questions and answers. I'm very curious to hear what David and Andy think about it. Uh, is more the question of wisdom and judgment, because it really depends on the circumstances. When should the president use that awesome authority to call out troops? Uh, when has rioting and looting become so bad that it overwhelms state or local authorities? Can the president call out troops when state and local authorities have the resources, but they choose not to use them? I think that's what's going on in Seattle now. So uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me a chance to give this quick presentation on the Insurrection Act. Uh, I look forward to questions and comments from all of you watching, and I really look forward to uh, exchanging these ideas with uh, Andy and David. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you, John. Um, Andy, uh, let's hear your thought. Well, thank you, Kurt, and thanks to the committee. And I'm also delighted to be here with my friends uh, discussing these issues today. It's uh, uh, it, 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 I really wish we could have more of these things where we actually got to uh, be together and in, uh, in person, but this will this will have to do for a while. I, I'd also say that uh, John has addressed what I would have said about uh, the federalism considerations here uh, better than I would have. I, I would just say this as somebody who worked in law enforcement for a long time and maybe uh, also relevant, somebody who grew up in the Bronx, <laughs> New York, in the bad old days of the, yep. uh, of the 1960s and 70s, I, I frankly think, especially watching everything that, that's going on uh, on a nightly basis uh, and horrified as everyone else is, that we've kind of been spoiled by a generation plus of really um, unprecedented, in a way, uh, domestic tranquility. In New York, for example, as Heather McDonald often points out, homicide was over 2,000 a year in the late 80s and early 90s. The New York City Police Department has driven down, and, and the policing approach that was, was uh, really revolutionized in New York, this intelligence-based policing that uh, sometimes called CompStat, has driven homicide rates down 86%, 86% between 1990 and today. So, I, you know, when I think about that, I, I think of a couple of things. One is the anomaly of the idea that the federal government necessarily has better ideas than, than state and local governments do about effective policing. Because I think that the best ideas about policing that have come out uh, in the last generation have been more state and local than federal. And I, it, from what we can detect over the last couple of years, the federal government has plenty of trouble and plenty of abuse uh, in trying to control its own law enforcement agency. So I don't, I'm not sure they're one to talk uh, to the states. Um, the other thing I, I'd say, and this goes to John's remark, um, whether the president should should uh, call in the troops or not, whether he should invoke the Insurrection Act, really depends on whether order has been lost. And I, I must say, as a law enforcement person, I think the assumption that we often make is that law enforcement can establish order. And the fact of the matter is it can't. Law enforcement can preserve order if you already have it established as an assumption. But I think once order is lost, the fact of the matter is, as John pointed out, you know, think about how much bigger the New York City Police Department is than our federal law enforcement agencies, and they are overmatched when some of the things that have gone on the street uh, go on, as, as we've seen. So to my mind, if, if order is lost, the president has an obligation to restore it and to do what has to be done. Uh, in order to restore it. And that obviously depends on what the local conditions are. But we ought to be mindful of the fact that once it's lost, I don't think law enforcement can reestablish it. Let me briefly touch on a couple of things that, that uh, uh, we talked about me addressing. One is the, uh, the Chauvin case, which we're all, or the, the uh, murder in uh, Mr. Floyd in Minneapolis, which we're all obviously uh, 
horrified by. My concern about that is that it's both overcharged and undercharged in a way. I think the first set of charges that came out, which uh, accused Chauvin, Derek Chauvin, the, the police officer who was kneeling on the neck of Mr. Floyd, uh, of, of what's known as depraved indifferent uh, homicide, was probably the most appropriate charge that they could have brought. And I was sorry to see that get superseded by, not that that charge is gone, but by adding an intentional murder charge on a uh, felony murder theory, which is basically premised on the theory that when the police respond with force to somebody who is resisting, they may be guilty of uh, committing aggravated assault. I think if that's a message that you're going to communicate to the police, uh, that's a very dangerous message to send. It seems to me that depraved indifference uh, murder was a much better match. Um, secondly, with the other three officers, uh, I think it was ill-conceived for them to charge them on an aiding and abetting theory, particularly with the negligent homicide, which I think is probably the best of all the charges. Uh, aiding and abetting is a theory under which you have to understand what your principle is trying to accomplish and then join yourself to it in some affirmative way. On the other hand, with negligence, nobody's really trying to accomplish anything because uh, these are consequences that uh, come about by recklessness or uh, by accident. Uh, so I, I just think that they'd be better off charging the other three officers with negligent homicide rather than on an aiding and abetting theory. And I think they'll have a problem with that if they maintain it. Uh, two other quick points. One, um, no-knock warrants, which is another thing that we're um, concerned about, particularly in connection with the uh, tragic uh, Breonna Taylor case in Kentucky. Um, I know that there's a lot of heat, especially on Capitol Hill, and oddly uh, uh, from both sides of the aisle, uh, against no-knock warrants. And I can only say, as somebody who practiced in this area, it's absolutely something that ought to be looked at. It's something that there ought to be a default against. We shouldn't have no-knock warrants as like your standard fare. But no-knock warrants are absolutely necessary in certain situations when you're dealing with violent criminal organizations that are often better armed than the police are. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, if you don't have them and they have to knock and announce their presence before they come in, uh, very unfortunately, uh, not infrequently, what happens is there will be uh, assaults and potentially deadly assaults against the police before they can enter. People talk about worrying about the destruction of evidence. That's a problem. I worry about the safety of the police as they try to come through the door. So I think you know, this is a mainly local issue. It ought to be looked at carefully. But I think the idea of getting rid of no-knock warrants completely uh, is going to make it very difficult to police against the offenders who, the, who are the most dangerous and the most threatening uh, to our society. Uh, and let me just close quickly, and maybe we can develop this more when we, when we, uh, uh, when we take questions. But um, you know, there's a lot of attention now to what's going on on Capitol Hill in the way of legislation. But I think that the way the left in this country plans to do police reform uh, is what we already saw throughout the Obama administration, which is not by legislation, but by a statute that was enacted during the uh, Clinton administration in 1994 which enables the Justice Department to file civil suits against municipalities or, their, or the states or their police organizations on the theory that they have a pattern or practice of discrimination uh, in policing, among other things. And what, I'm, what I'd be fearful of is what happens in these situations is the Justice Department comes in with its $30 billion budget. No municipality can afford to, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. And what happens invariably in these cases is they get essentially extorted into signing consent decrees with the state, where at that point in the consent decree, they have a model of policing that they then impose on the state. And you either agree to do their policing or you have to 
engage in this ruinous litigation. That's the way that you're going to get police reform. So we have a lot of theatrics on Capitol Hill right now, but I don't think that's the way it's going to happen. Why don't I leave it at that for, uh, uh, as a warm-up for David? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Uh, David, uh, last but not least. Thank you, and uh, Kurt, it's a pleasure to be with you, and indeed, it's a pleasure to be with uh, my good friends, uh, uh, John and, uh, and Andy, and I only complain that I'm obviously not capable of rising to this arterial occasion, and I'd be interesting for the audience, but John for and once, I... For once, for once, Rivkin is underdressed, for once. I, listen, <laughs> play, play the pandemic, uh, but I'm in my office, for the record, two blocks away from Lafayette Park. Look, um, I want to speak very briefly uh, um, about uh, qualified immunity, but I'm, I'm tempted to wade into John's area for a minute. I'm very much interested in the Insurrection Act, which point out the obvious that even before this particular Insurrection Act that dates back to uh, early 1900s, I mean, there are different versions of, of statutes essentially accomplishing the same thing going back to, to the founding. It's, it's, it's quite obvious. And second, the number of times federal troops were used uh, over a period, in addition to dealing with, with unrest precipitated by rioting and looting, uh, is actually uh, well over 100 based upon some sources I've seen. And interestingly enough, a lot of them dated uh, to the 20th century, early 20th century, when the country was afflicted with a wave of labor violence, uh, violent strikes involving mines and, and factories. So federal troops were dispatched, if I'm not mistaken, at least 20 or 30 times, literally in the space of 10, 15 years, uh, to you know, uh, reoccupy most facilities and, and expel the, the strikers. So there's just further, I'm not suggesting it kind of routinizes decision making, but it certainly shows the broad range of circumstances, right, where the Insurrection Act was used. Now, on the qualified immunity, uh, I would say the following. One, one, it's a bad policy and it's a bad law. And one of the things that surprises me is the extent to which the conservatives pay homage to qualified immunity, perhaps by not realizing or realizing but not caring that this is not anything that Congress has done. Uh, qualified immunity really stems from a classical example of a war in court legislating from the bench taking the language of Section 1983 of, of 1871 uh, Civil Rights Act that talked clearly, did not contain any qualified immunity, talked clearly about holding um, uh, state uh, officials, state and municipal officials liable for violations of constitutional rights. Um, it was done in a series of cases, uh, first one really being Pearson uh, in uh, in 67, then again in, in Harlow in a couple of cases in uh, the 1980s and, and in, in 1992, uh, on an absolutely absurd statutory interpretation theory. The argument the court deployed was that, well, look, uh, it's so well established, it's kind of ironic, in a second, the clearly established part of qualified immunity, but it's so well established historically with police officers and similar officials enjoy qualified immunity that uh, Congress would have required uh, the 1871 Act to extend it does not feature what we call in the business a, clear, a, a super clear statement rule. Congress did not mean to, uh, to abolish it. Well, uh, it, it, it ain't so. Um, I mean, another thing that, that, that surprises me is, uh, the, 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 perhaps I should not be surprised, the case law in this area is, is quite horrible. Uh, I mean, the, in addition to both good faith defense, to me, one of the most impossible to clear obstacles to uh, liability is the so-called clearly established one. I will not get in all the examples. It would take a long time, but the Supreme Court was presented with uh, close to a dozen cert petitions. A lot of it, by the way, John, originated out of your favorite circuit, the Ninth Circuit. Um, and a the, the, the couple of buttes, as far as I'm concerned, uh, are this. So uh, you have a police officer, uh, officers that sick the dog on, uh, on a person who indeed was surrendering, was on his knees. 
And uh, the argument that the Ninth Circuit bought into was because the previous case involved police seeking a dog on a man who surrendered while lying on the ground, it was not clearly established that if you're kneeling, it's the same. Um, absurd on its face, and another, another kind of a funny slash sad case involved some police officers, minority, I'm sure, were executing a warrant and stole over $200 worth of, uh, of money and, uh, and jewelry. And the court said, well, it's kind of wrong, but it's not clearly established that you're not supposed to steal, <laughs> to steal stuff in the executive police for. Um, so uh, Supreme Court unfortunately denied all cert petitions, putting things back in, in the congressional basket. So I don't quite understand why conservatives are supporting this, given its genesis. But as a policy matter, uh, look, I understand, while I've not dealt with it professionally, at least I understand theoretically the stresses and dangers of police work, but um, there are a lot of other professions uh, where you have to make split-second decisions impacting life and limb. Uh, I had a piece in the journal earlier this month on this issue, and a lot of people wrote letters, emails, most not very complimentary, suggesting that I don't understand the unique nature of police officers. My simple response to be, what about medical professionals? If you're a doctor in the ER and somebody is brought in and you feel like you need to open this person up to save his or her life, I mean, you're using, <laughs> you're using the kind of force that, that is quite overwhelming. I don't think there's any qualified immunity for doctors. I'm not sure how that would work. So it, it, it's not clearly established that you should not unnecessarily remove a splint because the Previous case involved the pancreas. Anyway, no macabre jokes. Um, it's a bad policy. I, I think it would instill an additional deterrent. And by the way, one thing that you should know, uh, in most instances, even if you're able to get to the merits and get past qualified immunity, uh, the legal fees are being paid by the police department slash uh, the city or, or county involved. And if there is an award, it almost never comes out of a hide of, of the officer. I mean, one final point, um, in my view, it's not just about police officers and more in court extended qualified immunity, obviously, to other state officials. But one of the things that, that I find depressing, in addition to police abuses, which are can be quite horrific, as, uh, as we've all seen uh, recently, there's widespread practice of state officials really engaging in actions that discriminate against conservatives. Perfect example or advanced on ideological viewpoint. I can tell you from my experience practicing law, but it is virtually impossible in most cities, and not just in the West Coast, East Coast as well, uh, to get uh, zoning permits to open a hotel or environmental permit, unless you commit in advance to labor union agree. Needless to say, uh, if you did not have qualified immunity, that type of behavior would, would clearly make people involved liable. Um, uh, it's a classic form of, uh, of, uh, of content discrimination I think would be quite difficult uh, to justify. I mean, other examples, you have cities like Chicago, for example, that have refused. And by the way, it's all very blatant. Nobody attending refused to give uh, permits to Chick-fil-A to open uh, uh, various locations because Chick-fil-A does not espouse the same use that the city of Chicago finds congenial. So I, I think cleaning up qualified immunity would be good across the range of issues. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, before um, I ask some questions, um, would any of you, uh, David, uh, commented on uh, some of what John talked about? Would anybody else like to uh, comment on what their uh, fellow uh, panelists brought up? Yeah, one question I think that uh, everybody would be interested in is uh, this Senate bill, the House bill about police reforms. Where does the federal power come from to set out right, what the police procedures have to be? Think about um, chokeholds or no-knock warrants, as Andy said. If there's a case that sometimes they're necessary, sometimes they're not necessary, then how could they fall under the constitutional right of Congress under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to say they are necessary to, right, to protect life, liberty, and property if you know, there are clear sets of cases where they're not uh, depriving people that they're just necessary police time? 
And I guess I'll throw in, are there any Tenth Amendment problems there? Yeah, let me uh, I, if I may go first quickly, I agree with John. Uh, I think that you can certainly attach conditions um, using the spending clause to whatever grants are being given. And, you know, uh, we, we do know what the, uh, what the law is in this space. Uh, with, uh, you were against that in the Obamacare case, if I remember, David. Well, yes, but I, uh, <laughs> I think that this is not a gun to the head. Okay. <laughs> Reasonable conditions clearly spelled out. You can do that. But I agree with you. I, I do not see how you can regulate uh, the discharge of, uh, of a policing function by, uh, by co-equal sovereigns. And I, I mean, aside from the, the textual limitations in Article 1, I, I do think there, there are serious uh, federalism problems. And look, I mean, the existing federalism case, New York and, and Prince, the commandeering incursion doctrines, to me, do not exhaust the totality of federalism concerns. They are specific manifestations of federalism principles as applied to particular type of attempted preservations by the federal government. But I think, you know, telling the state uh, in total how to discharge its police, uh, policing function is, is, is a tremendous imposition on a co-equal sovereigns. I, I, would just, I would just add to that that um, the ethos of, of law enforcement, federal law enforcement, particularly, I, I mean, I can speak mostly to New York, but I think this is true of Washington as well, and probably most of the big cities around the country, is not even to think about what the potential federal jurisdictional hook is for uh, I intruding into what are normally uh, state law areas of policing. I remember when I was uh, a supervisor of a unit in the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, I had a young assistant come in who wanted to indict a, uh, a push-in robbery. And I asked, you know, what our jurisdictional hook was that could conceivably make that into a federal crime. And um, he, he first hadn't thought of that. And then he came back to me and told me that um, Evidently, there was no printing press of, um, of, of currency in New York. The nearest one was in Pennsylvania. So because the cash was in interstate commerce, the feds could come in and regulate everything, which seemed to me to be a, a fairly extravagant theory. But it, it's not, you know, the, the, the idea in U.S. attorney's offices, especially the ones who, who think of themselves as creative, is to push the boundaries of what federal jurisdiction is, and not to think about, is this really something appropriate for us to be doing? All right, thank you. Um, let me ask some uh, follow-up questions. I'll go roughly in the order that we, uh, we tackled these issues. Um, John, I know I found it very uh, frustrating that, uh, you know, to keep hearing about how uh, uh, Trump's use of uh, troops would be unprecedented and uh, you know, how governors have to approve. Um, you know, why do you think we've, um, we've sort of heard, uh, you know, the law so misstated there? I mean, is it ignorance? Is it politics? Um, is it uh, what I've called Trump law? That's just uh, my term for when the president's opponents kind of invent new legal standards, you know, to try to show the president's doing something wrong. I mean, what, what's going on there? I, I invite David and Andy to talk about this too, because I think it's not legal, it's political. And what I, I mean, we could talk about issue after issue. I think this is just another one where uh, Trump's critics are so outraged by Trump, they're willing to undo decades, if not centuries, of constitution, settled constitutional understandings. Uh, and I always ask them, now that the polls are shifting towards Biden, do you really want to strip President Biden of any of his powers too? To, you know, to the point where Federal judges are going to order the Justice yep. Department who to prosecute, and you're going to yep. say the every time the president wants to call out the military, it's a coup, and call on call on retired generals to coordinate a political attack on the president yep. for invoking the Insurrection Act, which has been on the books. As David said, it's not even just 1807; it's back to 1789 in one version or another. And so that's what I think is going on. And so it's a species along with. Um, Trump's critics saying, let's get rid of the Electoral College, let's increase the Supreme Court to 15 justices, let's get rid of the Senate. And so every time it's, yep. it's a strange dynamic, it's the uh, 
critics of Trump were the ones accusing him of uh, tearing down the Constitution, who are the ones actually assaulting, you know, long constitutional practice and understanding. It's a strange dynamic. Usually it's the populists like Trump, right, who want to, you know, toss out the old understandings and bring in the new, but he's actually, you know, when it comes to issues like this, he's actually the conservative in the sense of conserving what has been tradition. It's a very uh, upside down dynamic uh, compared to like an Andrew Jackson or a Lincoln or FDR. Yeah, so there's, uh, but I think it's more political than, than, than legal. Yeah, no, um, and maybe we should do a whole separate panel on, again, what I've called Trump law, because I really wonder uh, whether any of these sta- new I, standards are uh, by his critics. <laughs> 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 let, me just, let me say, Kurt, if we have a panel on this, you'd need to book at least three or four hours. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, for John, and look, we're, we're lawyers here, we're not political scientists, but I do want to mention one thing that depresses uh, one of our most salient features of civil military relations, of course, in our constitutional and political system is the civilian control of the military. I am greatly troubled, uh, and let's put aside the retired officer. Somebody like the chairman of JCS, General Milley, speaks up about the fact that it was a mistake for me to walk across the park with the president because he was engaged in political gesture. I think not only it's conduct unbecoming, to use the term from UCMJ, but I mean, it, it basically reflects to me, and then, then nobody on the left, of course, is a bit to criticize. It reflects a tremendous uh, change in how the military should approach those issues. I mean, whether or not the president walking across the park was a political gesture, whether or not it was a gesture designed to reassure the citizens, and reassurance is an important function of president and you do it using the bully pulpit and sometimes you do it using images so being able to walk across the church uh, across Lafayette park st john's church and hold a bible i mean how can that be a bad thing uh, <laughs> yeah. what were you doing it for yep. purposes of <laughs> demonstrating you know uh your political machismo or you're doing it to demonstrate that law and order would be respected so for Millie to get into that lane at all i think is terrible. I'm frankly not very hip on retired generals uh, doing that, but I suppose they can say, well, we're no longer in the military. So the norms that are being eroded are not just constitutional norms, they're important institutional behavioral norms, which I I think we should all hold dear, liberals, conservatives, whatever. I I would just add to that that, um, you know, I've spent the last couple of days on, uh, on General Flynn and that whole uh, fiasco before Judge Sullivan. And it's just, it strikes me that, you know, we know now as, as we're sitting here because of things that the Attorney General has recently said, that we're probably going to get something from the Durham investigation in the next two months. And what, what the Attorney General has, I've heard tell people is, you know, you should not be thinking about this in terms of the Durham report, because the first decision that prosecutors always have to make is charges. And they are treating this as a serious criminal investigation, and there may be indictments that come out of it. And I just, I wonder if the, if the polls hold, and let's say we have a Biden administration come January, does anyone conceivably think that when the Biden Justice Department flushes whatever charges are brought by Durham, that anyone is going to remember anything they said during the Flynn case? I mean, right now, you would believe to listen to these guys <laughs> that the Justice Department dismissing a case that it's looked into on its own and realized should not have been brought in the first place is the biggest scandal in the history of scandals. And I have a feeling that, you know, if things hold the way they, they, they look like at the moment, uh, come February or March of, of next year, um, whether people will be singing a very different tune. Um, yeah, ironic, because just a few uh, years ago, it would have been liberals who uh, would have been all for the Justice Department recognizing when it had overreached. But uh, again, that probably uh, the hypocrisy is probably a, a different panel. Well, while we're on Biden, uh, Andy, what you said about uh, a DOJ bringing pattern and practice cases against uh, police departments, are you thinking that'll happen under Trump or, or just if we get a Democratic president? 
Uh, I don't know what will happen under Trump if we get a second Trump administration. Um, I've been disturbed by the ardor of the administration, uh, both to uh, accede to the uh, institutional racism charges and to be on this uh, on this train of police reform when I don't think we're addressing what, you know, usually the left wants to address root causes. And, I, you know, it seems to me that uh, if, if uh, you know, if one out of four children in America is, is born into a fatherless home, that seems to me to be a bigger problem than police reform because uh, it, it leads to a lot of the dysfunction that, um, that the police have to, to deal with. But um, I, don't, I don't know what a second Trump administration would bring. I can only say that what the Obama administration did when it was in office was bring these pattern and practice cases. And in a variety of cities and towns across the country, they forced the municipalities to sign these consent decrees. Uh, and th they basically have a model of Obama policing that was adopted. And I think that uh, that's something that can be done in a big way, under the radar, without a big debate on Capitol Hill. And it's a much more effective way for them to proceed, even though it's an incremental strategy. Thanks, Andy. Um, I guess I'll follow up with, and this is really for all of you. I think we all agree what happened in Minneapolis and, and in a number of these other cases is clearly police abuse. Um, but is there any, any evidence that these cases, either individually or overall, are are evidence of, of racial discrimination? Let me go. I think I I'm sorry, go ahead. Dave. No, uh, not, not my area, but I, from everything I've read, I don't think so. There's absolutely no evidence, no matter how you look at it, that that is the case. I think these are, uh, what we see is individual misconduct born out of uh, perhaps inadequate training or inadequate abilities. Maybe in some individual cases, uh, racism of all, I mean, there's, look, it, it's a difficult balance to strike in a civilized society. You want police that would be vigorous uh, in maintaining law and order. And in, in some instances, uh, police gets overly vigorous, use an anodyne term, and does bad things and uses deadly force unnecessarily. And uh, certainly deadly force is not used exclusively in minorities. There are plenty of instances, I mean, Plenty. Again, I'm not trying to damn the police here. We're a country of 350 plus million people, but there are instances every year where the deadly force is used in unjustified fashion on whites, and they die. So I, uh, I, I think this, this this whole thing makes makes no sense. The, yeah, the, I, I uh, just... the interpretation of police misconduct driven by some kind of systematic racism. Believe me, and just one last point. Look, if you look at where it happened. We're talking about police departments, uh, not only in, 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 in blue cities and, and, and counties, but police departments that are often run by minorities and have high percentage of minority officers. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, one of the officers charged in, uh, in connection with uh, George Floyd's horrible death is a minority. If you, if you look at the other three officers, I don't remember his name, but am I wrong, Andy? No, that, that's right. And... You know, across the country, police forces are increasingly reflective of the ethnic and racial makeup of the communities that they serve. Uh, the police department in Atlanta, in fact, where we've had the most recent incident, uh, is close to 60 percent African-American in a town that's actually 54 uh, percent African-American. Uh, so, I, you know, I think the institutional racism charges is, is overstated with respect to police for uh, obvious reasons. And then the, uh, the only other thing I would add to, to the last point David made is we all happen to be conservative lawyers. Um, that puts us in a distinctive minority. Uh, <laughs> our profession is overwhelmingly progressive. And I think the, the reason for mentioning that is the criminal justice system is dominated by political progressives. And I'm always stunned by the thought that anyone would think that they would tolerate their institution being systematically racist. Uh, you know, for those of us who've actually worked in it, um, 
what you what you encounter on a day to day basis is something close to the opposite of what the narrative is. But I just think the whole you know, the whole premise that you're dealing with a system that is systematically racist that's actually dominated by progressives is a head scratcher to me. Yeah, no, it reminds me of the argument that racial preferences and admissions are necessary for universities to combat the uh, systemic racism in the uh, university admissions process, which are, of course, all run by progressives who uh, wouldn't uh, do everything possible to, uh, to be uh, the, whatever the opposite of, uh, of racist is. Um, one of our uh, audience members asked about uh, systemic racism, uh, but I think we've sort of, we've probably uh, largely uh, addressed that. Uh, while we're on the subject of, uh, well, universities, uh, John, we've seen a number of uh, hiring, I'm sorry, firings and attempted firing uh, of professors and others in the education field for criticizing Black Lives Matter. Um, I wanted to know if you had any thoughts on that, David. You also brought up, uh, uh, you know, issues of uh, discriminating against conservative viewpoints. So if any of you want to address, um, you know, what's been going on with, um, uh, you know, basically uh, this purge of, of those who express conservative thoughts, especially in academia and what, you know, recourse uh, any of these people might have. It ties in with it. <clears throat> Andy and David were just saying in part because it's not just uh, the legal profession that's uh, progressive. It is, of course, the academy. And so I think there's a widespread assumption in the academy that structural racism exists and that uh, academic and police forces and law enforcement uh, generally. I think this is where the idea of over-criminalization uh, came from uh, originally. Uh, and you have seen these cases. There's a case of a professor at Cornell named, uh, I think, William Jacobson, who uh, questioned or raised doubts about Lives Matter's agenda as opposed to the, num the protesters themselves. And there are people trying to, you know, I think something like 20 members of his own faculty signed a letter to try to get him fired. There's uh, an economist at the University of Chicago, quite a prominent guy named Ulig, I think, who um, Paul, uh, Paul Krugman and other liberal economists are trying to get stripped of prestigious editorships and so on because, but because I think he sent out a tweet just saying Black Lives Matter has torpedoed itself by turning to violence. Uh, you know, I don't even, you know, so he's, and then there's a, I think, a accounting professor at UCLA Business School who was just fired um, for uh, refusing to grant students extra time, black students are for extra time on their exams in the wake of the, so I, uh, unfortunately, I think these are not, uh, isolated cases. I think they do reflect this, Andy's talking about, David's talking about this sort of overwhelming mindset. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I'm encouraged there's a Harvard economist who's out there with studies saying uh, the actual use of deadly force against unarmed blacks by law enforcement is actually lower than you would expect and that you see it used more on whites. And he's also said that after high profile viral uh, criticism of the police in the wake of uses of force, you see policing go down in those cities and murders go way up, right? So, uh, you know, at least there's some uh, dissenting voices and that we should, when it comes to these questions of structural racism, you would expect in the academy at least, but maybe, uh, you know, we have to look to think tanks, lawyers, commentary, national review, people like David, to raise questions about what's the data actually show. That's what the ac ac academy should be doing, but it's not. Um, and the other question that you always hear in social sciences, I, you know, we should put to our progressive friends, is what, what's what would be a falsifiable case? What would you need to see to prove there was no structural racism in law enforcement? Or is it so endemic it can never be done? Which is what seems to be, right? There doesn't seem to be any set of facts that you can show that would disprove structural racism. Unfortunately, I guess my point is, unfortunately, you're not seeing those questions come out of the academy because of this overwhelming mindset. And then the, I think these outrages on the academic freedom of people who have dissenting views. Right. If I can add one point, uh, which I find particularly depressing, uh, I don't think it happened, at least I've not seen reports that it happened on campus, but as, as a subset of a broader cancel culture, and let me stipulate that it's horrible punish people for exercise of their 
expressive or associational rights guaranteed by the First Amendment. It's bad enough. But we have several instances where people have been canceled. That's a way of saying fired for the expressive activities, not of their own, but of their relatives. Yep. Uh, that, a, a couple of examples, which actually involves the, the West Coast, or the left coast, uh, there was a, uh, again, I presume the facts are, are correct uh, based upon the reports I've seen yet. A, uh, a player, a Serb guy who was playing for an island, L.A. soccer team, don't remember the name, and his wife tweeted something in Serbian that uh, was not exactly complimentary of Black Lives Matter, and he was first forced to denounce her, and then he was still fired. I mean, that just sends chills down my spine because it, it reminds me of some of my personal experiences. As some of you may know, I was not born in this country. I was born in the Soviet Union and came here as, as a young teenager, and I remember the same thing happening when I was leaving. My dad worked at an announcement for head of a, uh, of a department in a large hospital, so he first forced to denounce me and then fired. And it just absolutely sticks in my craw. And if you want it, setting aside the personal feelings, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that back in the Middle Ages would be called corruption of blood. Um, and you would think that it should have left and indeed did go away with enlightenment. So the fact that we have people, again, horrible to punish people for, for their own activities, punish people for something done by your relatives. I mean, that just takes the cake. I, I, I'm absolutely horrified. By Thanks, David. Actually, uh, let me go to an audience question that uh, I guess I'll direct it. David, um, uh, one person asked, should the qualified immunity standard um, be different for police officers who risk their lives than for ordinary uh, government officials. I mean, we've almost heard the opposite recently, you know, which is that um, there should be less protection for police officers, but should there be more because they're risking their lives in the line of duty? Uh, I don't think so. Let me kind of give you a technical answer. Look, uh, the question of liability for merit purposes is an important one, and it has to be set in a, in a proper fashion. That's why, for example, I, I don't believe it's useful to go from the reasonableness standard in uh, discerning whether the use of force was justified to a necessary standard. Uh, and I think that you can come up with a sufficient uh, comfort zone, if you will, for police officers putting their life in the line. And, and by the way, the fact that they're putting their life in the line isn't so much relevant in a sense that they should be free to to run a mod, it's that if you put your life on the line, your split second decisions are shaped, imbued with a particular uh, type of circumstance that does not exist if you're an architect sitting down figuring out how to uh, do building. Uh, so to me, the whole qualified immunity is just unnecessary bump uh, on the road to figuring out what is the right liability. So no, I would not buy that. And let me also say, I. Uh, apropos of, of some of Andy's excellent work, I would love to expand 1983 to federal government. Uh, and, and I think that given what we've seen in the last several years emerge of all the abuses uh, circa 2016, across by hurricane and all the other things that happened thereafter, I mean, it would be curative. I mean, where is, where is the church and pike committee type hearings as set as some of you may Remember in history, these were uh, efforts by the congressional Democrats and justifiable to a certain extent to rein in the CIA abuses during the Cold War. I mean, we have much worse abuses. So, no, this is not the time to, uh, uh, from a policy perspective, buttress qualified immunity. Yeah. Can, I, can I just, um, I, I'm, I'm going to respectfully disagree with David. <laughs> I, I, I think um, I agree wholeheartedly both with the idea of extending it, extending whatever the liability is to the, to, to the federal uh, agencies as well. And I completely agree with David's uh, legal interpretation of the statute. I think that the qualified immunity is something that's been invented out of whole cloth. It's not in the statute. It's ordinarily the kind of thing that, um, uh, that, that we would say the courts had no business legislating, particularly the way uh, they took off with the, the doctrine in the 60s and the 70s. 
I do think, though, that, you know, this is why God made Congress. Uh, they ought to be having hearings where we find a, or at least we try to find a sweet spot between the kind of outrageous, egregious, reckless stuff that the, the way the doctrine is now applied has immunized, which I think everybody sensible thinks should not happen, versus uh, what the level of negligence should be because police have to have a right to be wrong. If they don't, you're not going to get the kind of policing that you need to keep the community safe. So I do agree that these egregious cases have to be addressed, and the standard has to be different, and it's Congress's job to figure out what that standard ought to be, or in the state legislatures, it's their job to figure out what the, the standard ought to be. But I, I do think that we ought to be exploring some kind of measure of immunity for police. I'm throwing a, a question uh, for Andy and David, because I'm not sh uh, sure exactly how it would work, but um, if you got rid of qualified immunity, wouldn't it, it just, just a cough shifting issue? Wouldn't it just mean that most police departments would get insurance policies against lawsuits? Uh, and so really would just sh it would shift the cost of these lawsuits to the taxpayers, one, or cities and counties don't, then you're going to have a much lower quality of police officer. Because who's going to, right, to go into these jobs where they have this Sandy said, huge threat of lawsuit? So it seems to me it'll be like uh, uh, you know, directors and officers' liability insurance for companies, right? Where we spend a lot of time talking about shareholder lawsuits against companies, but in reality, it's just about shifting the cost of defending the lawsuits around. Is that what if would I, really happen? If I may just respond briefly, cost shifting, I'm not an economist, but I think an economist would say that cost shifting is a useful function. If you're going to buy insurance immunizing yourself from certain types of lawsuits, uh, the insurance underwriter, the risk assessment people, are going to charge you very different premiums based upon what they believe to be your standard training and, and, and conduct baselines. And they could be worse things in life than having the private sector innovate a little bit in this space. Look, again, I, uh, uh, I, unlike Andy, I don't have much experience in law enforcement, but I, uh, I spent a considerable portion of my time dealing with defense issues, including laws of war. I mean, look at the military example. The military is, and not to say there are no violations of the laws of war. Of course, there are sometimes, and they're war crimes. But the military has over, particularly U.S. military, and Israeli military, and other militaries have come up with a kind of training procedures that are able to balance the ability to deploy or employ the deadliest forces the drop of a hat with the necessary restraint to avoid breaching the laws of war, targeting non-combatants, minimizing collateral damage. I don't see why they cannot be done with police departments because, again, as tough it is, police, uh, particularly neighborhoods that have a lot of criminal activities, cannot be any tougher than counterinsurgents in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, or a Vietnam War. So if, if we can have a military that knows how to you know, inculcate the proper spirit and train people, why can't we do it with police? Well, I, I, I guess I would just say with respect to that, that there, there is, a, even though I have great respect for what the military has been able to accomplish, uh, particularly in this uh, half century plus where we don't talk about victory anymore, and you had, you've had the military in uh, very difficult situations. It's a very different thing uh, to adhere to the laws and customs of war versus to do policing that respects the high level of due process that we extend to Americans in peacetime domestic in the United States. I just, I, I don't think that those two things are equivalent. And again, what I'm concerned about is if the police in any way uh, are, are made to think that they are going to be the subject of suits, even if it ultimately somebody else is going to be the, the pocket that pays for it. Um, if these lawsuits become a regular thing, um, what you're going to have is police taking fewer of the risks that we need them to take on the street. And I do think that, you know, to the extent that we've compared them to other professions, 
police are people that we expect to go into situations where there's aggression and danger and, and sort them out. I think it's a very different uh, set of duties and obligations that we impose on them. For sure. Let me ask uh, one last question from the audience. It's a good uh, wrap-up question. They ask about sort of the impact of all these issues on 2020 election. Let me, let me narrow it a little bit. Um, you know, there's important legal issues here that we talked about, qualified immunity, um, civil rights uh, suits brought by the government, police reform. Um, are we going to have any serious debate or progress on these issues, uh, you know, between now and November, or is it just going to be a political circus? Easiest uh, and shortest answer, it is going to be a political circus. Uh, the bill by uh, Senator Scott is not going to get any hearing in the Senate. The House Democrats are going to pass a, a pretty outrageous bill. It's not going to get any traction in the Senate. And the Democrats are going to point fingers at Republicans and say Republicans don't want to do anything about police. That's my prediction, unfortunately. Any other prediction? I, I don't think... Um... I think that law and order is going to be a big issue in the campaign. I don't think it'll be about the legislation on Capitol Hill. I know everyone's positioning themselves, um, but you know, I'm gonna. I guess I'll end where I began, which is uh, in the Bronx in the 1960s and, and 70s, um, when when it's not safe to walk the streets, which is the way it's becoming in a lot of places in the United States. That becomes your major issue on your personal agenda. And if you, if people don't feel like they're safe, um, they are going to gravitate to the, the side that makes them think they'll get some security. All right. Well, we'll wrap up with that. Uh, let me uh, thank uh, our three guests. Um, uh, thank you for giving us your time. Thank you for making it a great panel. Uh, I certainly would not have been uh, the great panel that it was without such three uh, excellent guests. So uh, we do these every Thursday. Uh, so we'll see you uh, a week from now. Take care, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.